ね。Can y'all hear me okay? It's good to be with y'all today. My name is Lance Williams, and I'm from Paragould, Arkansas, and I'm currently living in Woodland Park, Colorado. My wife and I are in Karis Bible College. She's in her first year, and I'm about to finish up my fourth year. So, you know, this is my, I was a guest speaker uh, several months ago, but this is my first time with y'all in a while, so I just want to share my testimony with y'all today so that y'all can get to know me and um, yeah, so so y'all can get to know me and then I'll continue um, every week. So hopefully I'll get an opportunity to interact with y'all. So like I said, my name is Lance Williams, uh, born and raised in Arkansas, uh, grew up in a good family. And was, you know, raised with biblical principles. But my whole life revolved around sports. And which is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, when sports had too much of a place in my life. And my whole life revolved around sports. Uh, I played basketball, football, baseball. Did a little bit of uh, the high jump. Uh, but my... my my main sport that I excelled at was football. I played on defense and offense, but I had the most success at wide receiver. And my freshman year, when I was 15, I had an outstanding uh, season. It was, I, I, and I had a relationship with the Lord at the time, but I had an outstanding season. I, I used to pray, God, help me catch every ball that I should and even some that I shouldn't. And I'll tell you, that's exactly what happened that year. I actually played beyond my ability. I mean, I was pretty athletic and stuff, but I had, I had success, like more success than what I had ability, actually. And God just really prospered me because I asked him to. And so with that came a lot of positive attention. And I wasn't necessarily an arrogant person or nothing. But it, that positive attention felt really good. You know, people knew who I was. And the, but the last two games, I played with a big knot on my side. And I later found out I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And I've, I want to say it now so I don't forget to say it later, but I've since been healed of that totally. Uh, the doctor said I would have to have surgery every two to five years. And just all, you know, I can eat this, you can't eat this, and a bunch of regulations on my eating. And it was just bondage. And so that was when I was 15. Sure enough, I had surgery again when I was 19, so that's four years later. But now I've, I'm 29, and I hadn't had a surgery in 10 years, and I'm not going to have another surgery. I've been totally delivered from Crohn's disease. God has totally set me free. But when I first got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, I, I couldn't play sports for a while. And I didn't realize what happened at the time, but 
later on, I, I realized that my identity was actually in sports. So when, just a second, excuse me. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, when I was, uh, so I had, had surgery, couldn't play sports for a while. And I, like I said, I didn't realize until later that my identity was actually in sports. And so when that got taken from me when I was 15, then, I mean, I didn't know who I was. And I remember before I ever got the stitches, uh, the butterfly stitches out of my stomach, I got in a fist fight. I started drinking alcohol. I started smoking marijuana. Uh, it eventually led to anabolic steroids and cocaine, and then eventually to methamphetamine. And I've done, you know, like the psychedelics and all that too, but my main downfall was cocaine and methamphetamine. And so when that happened, when I couldn't play sports for a while, I started developing this other me. And when I, so when I started playing sports later on, when I recovered from the surgery and everything, well, that's when I was doing steroids and on cocaine. So instead of looking to God to prosper me, I turned to a false God named cocaine. And I started doing cocaine before my football games. And I was looking, I started looking to that to prosper me instead of God. And even though I had some you know, some good moments and stuff. I never had the success like I did my ninth grade year. It's because I turned from God. And I didn't really see it that way at the time because I always had a reverence for God, but I quit looking to Him for my success. So that just, I started down a road that was very, very dark. And at first, it was a lot of fun. You know, the Bible says that sin is fun for a season. And it was it was a lot of fun. I had a blast at first, but it took me to a dark place and made me feel good on the way there. And I ended up becoming a full-fledged meth addict and I brought a lot of hardship on my life. Um, you know, I was in some ungodly relationships that brought a lot of torment with it. I lost the trust in my family. Uh, it was just bad. I mean, I went from, you know, being about 220 pounds, 230 pounds, down to about 135, just looking really rough. Uh, because of the hardships, I just kind of gave up, and I started sticking a needle in my arm and, and shooting it up, and then I started selling drugs to pay for my habit. And so I now I'm a drug dealer and a and, uh, you know, an IV drug user and just not who God created me to be. And so it, it was a dark, dark place. And it opened me up to all kinds of demonic things. Uh, I started experiencing darkness that I didn't even know existed. And, you know, some of those things I would, I would wake up in the middle of the night and couldn't move, couldn't talk, and see these demonic beings uh, in the room with me. Uh, I would hear voices and see things, and, uh, you know, a lot of people told me at the time that it was a figment of my imagination, but really what it was, it was real. It's just because of the drugs and not resting, actually sleep deprivation, because on meth, you, you know, stay up for days at a time. So between the drugs and the sleep deprivation, I was actually opening myself up to the demonic realm. And really, looking back on it, because I, you know, because meth makes you where you don't want to eat, makes you where you don't want to sleep. So I was actually fasting for the devil in a way. And I was mocking God because when meth makes you stay up and you don't sleep, I mean, the only one that doesn't sleep is God. You know, God says that, you know, it, he doesn't rest. He doesn't sleep. And so it, it's actually a mockery of God is what meth makes you do. And it was, a, it was just a very dark time in my life. And God, uh, the enemy, Satan, started separating me from people who cared about me. And I felt disconnected from my family and from my other friends that were a positive influence. And I only felt really connected around a couple 
this one couple and then this other woman I was in a relationship with. And I later found out that both of them were in to witchcraft. And one, the relation, the woman I was in a relationship with, uh, I found out later was in the Wicca. She didn't tell me that until later on in the relationship. And then this other couple, they were into black magic. And like I said, didn't know that at the time either. And so the, I'm looking back on it, the enemy separated me from people who cared about me. And he put me around terrible influence. I mean, witchcraft. And it's the old Roman war tactic, divide and conquer. And he was dividing me from the good people and conquering me with witchcraft. And it was terrible. I experienced a lot of, a lot of terrible things. Uh, but one night I was actually uh, was visiting that couple uh, way out in this. Uh, sorry, just a second. How do you get this down? Sorry about that. So uh, one time I was visiting this couple and, you know, they lived way out in the woods and I thought it was actually like a safe place. And I went out there and I was actually, we were doing drugs, but I was actually talking about God, talking about the armor of God, the three strand cord. Uh, and this lady asked me to stand back to back with her. And she said, I want to show you something. And so I did. And when I stood back to back with her, something shot through my back and it felt like a claw raking over the inside of my chest, like raking over my heart. And it wasn't on the outside, but on the inside, just like a claw just raking over my heart. And at the, at the same time, it's like every muscle in my body drawed up. And I just, I just hit the floor. I mean, it was like a full body cramp. And it took me a while to finally get the strength to get back up off the floor. And when I did, my body was in like a shock wave. I mean, it was like just convulsing. And I'm looking at the people, I, I mean, I am just, for lack of a better word, just freaked out. And I'm looking at these people and they're just sitting there smiling at me, you know, like they had saw this before or something. And anyway, they ended up deceiving me into actually, because I encountered the spiritual realm, it was no doubt about that. But they deceived me into thinking that I had overcome a dark force. But it wasn't until months later that I realized that I didn't overcome a dark force. A dark force overcome me. And that night, something entered into my body, and it started controlling me from the inside. And I just was not liking who I was becoming. I would be very, very violent at times, and I would get in trance-like states. I would, uh, you know, pack up stuck just everything into a bag and walk out into the middle of a field and and just snap out of it and if any of you've been to some big cities a lot of times you'll see uh, homeless people on the sidewalk and they they'll be talking to themselves uh and just acting really strange and i've been in a state like that i've been in a state of mind like that where i'm talking to objects and just just terrible things. But, and I was doing things and I, I wasn't at the time. It's like, I don't know why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. This is not me. Uh, one night I was actually had a machete down my pants leg and was going to somebody's house. And I was really going with the intentions to murder somebody and God intervened in a, in an alleyway. That's a whole separate story, but, uh, just terrible, terrible things. I was in such a dark place uh, mentally, physically, uh, in every way, spiritually, in every way possible. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I, when I first, uh, recognized that something was going on, uh, it was actually because I was, I was painting for my dad one day and I'd splash some paint in my right eye. And I washed it out and everything, but when I went to check my eye later, I, I know this may sound out there, but I actually seen another eye on the inside of my eye. Not 
not like a human eye, but like the eye of some kind of creature. And I was just thinking, okay, I'm just, you know, I've been up too long. I'm, I'm high. I just need to go to rest, get some rest and everything will be fine. But when I went to bed and I got up and I, every time I'd look in my right eye, when I look closely, I could see another eye within my eye. It's really hard to explain, but it was like inside of my pupil, there was the eye of a creature. And it was only in my right eye, not in my left eye. And at that time, I started thinking something, something is going, going on here. And so I just, I started praying and I started asking God, God, I think that something is on the inside of me that don't need to be there. Because, you know, I knew of the word and I knew, I've heard about demonic possession and demonic oppression and all that. And I started thinking, God, I think, I think something is on the inside of me. And so I started praying. And anyway, there was this certain man that I had wanted to talk to for a long time. Uh, this guy had had similar experiences to what I had had. And I never met the guy, but so many people told me about this certain guy. His name was Bobby Payne. And they told me, you, you need to meet this guy. You need to talk with this guy. He you know, sound like y'all had similar experiences. And I actually wanted to talk to him three years before this, before this time when I was having, when I first started having like demonic things happen. And it's, it's really interesting because I wanted to talk to this guy for three years and looking back on it, God actually planted the seed before I actually had the real need. And so he knew, he knew what was going to happen. And he knew I would need to talk to this man. And so he planted a seed three years in advance. And one night I ended up getting introduced to him at the grocery store. And it was actually by that woman who was into witchcraft because she knew him because he used to be a big drug dealer in town. And uh, it's interesting because sometimes like that, it's like God can even use the wicked to help bring something good to pass. And that's what happened that woman introduced me and that that guy bobby invited me over to his house and i went over to his house and when i walked into his house it was just it was like a peace that i had never felt before i later found out he he told me he prayed and anointed prayed over the house and anointed the house before i got there and when i came in there i just sit down and talk to him and it's just like this this torment was not with me in a way it's strange but i just i just had a supernatural peace and i'm sitting there talking to him and he ends up just you know i told him the things that were going on and he could relate and he actually told me some stories that he went through and i finally found somebody that understood because see before that i would tell people surface level stuff and they they just couldn't comprehend what i was going through and they would just think that I was crazy. And in a way I was, but I just could not find anybody that understood. And I just, that's, that's what I longed for. I prayed and said, God, I just want somebody that understands where I'm at. And finally, I'm getting to talk to this, this guy who understands what I'm going through. And he ended up praying over me. And he said that I was going to be delivered, uh, that I was going to come to the Lord and that I was going to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues. And I didn't even know what that was at first. I, did, I didn't, I'd heard about tongues and all that and being filled with the Spirit, but I didn't, didn't know much about it.
Can y'all can y'all hear me? I apologize. I I don't know what happened. The iPad just shut off, so I apologize about that. You sound good. Okay. Who was that? I lost my train of thought now since the iPad shut off. I apologize. Um, oh yeah, I was talking to that man and he ended up prophesying over me, as I mentioned about, uh, being filled with the spirit, speaking with other tongues, didn't know what that was. And, uh, he ended up inviting me to his church and every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, three times a week, I would, I would desire to go to that church. But something would stop me every time. And uh, something would, I'd either be too high or that woman I was with would talk me out of going. And, but there, it was three weeks later and one Sunday night uh, rolled around and I, it was just in me. I was going no matter what. And I told that woman that I was with, I said, look, I said, I am, I'm going to church tonight. You can either stay here or you can go with me. Except I said it much, much more intense and more firm than what I just said it just now. And so anyway, I ended up going to church and she actually went with me. And I'm in this church. And when I walk in the doors, as soon as I walk in, there's a guy at the front of the church. And that's a pretty big room. So it was from a distance. And he said, or no, he, he stopped the conversation he was in and we locked eyes from a distance and he stopped the conversation and he walked over to me and he was talking to me. And every time he would look in my left eye, everything was fine. But every time he would look in my right eye, it was like my perception shifted. It's, it's almost, it's really hard to explain some of these spiritual things. Uh, natural words just don't don't really explain it that well. But when he would look in my right eye, it's like he was looking at something else. It's like he was looking at that beast on the inside of me. And so he would be switching eyes and it was like, it was freaking me out. I didn't, I don't even know what other word to describe it, but I was just like, what is going on? And it's like, God gave him the gift of discernment in that moment. And he was able to see this thing on the inside of me. And he ended up praying for me to be delivered. So he prayed for me to be delivered. And, you know, I didn't think much about it. And I sit down in the church, not on the very back row, but near the back. And so I'm, I'm sitting down there, you know, go through the worship. And the preacher gets up there and he starts preaching. And I just remember it echoing throughout my whole being. He said, expect change, expect change. And he just kept saying that, expect change. And something in me was like, he's talking to me. And so, but at this time, it's like I'm, I'm sitting in the chair and, you know, I'm about to explain some things that, you know, some of you may think it sounds really out there, but it's 100% true. I know I was there and all this stuff really did happen. And it's, and I, it's, it's even hard to explain to what level it did happen because my words don't hold what really happened to me that night. So anyway, I'm sitting there in the chair and it's like, I felt like a giant like thumb in my back and like my, and somebody grabbing my shoulders and like pulling my shoulders back and pressing on my back. But it wasn't, there was nobody touching my back, no man behind me. But what I, what I later realized was that was the finger of God. And it's in the scriptures that God, he cast out demons with his finger. I forget exactly where it's at, but it's in the gospels. You can find it. But he cast out, he, he cast out demons with his finger. And what was happening was there was the finger of God in my back and my shoulders, like something was being pressed out of me. And at this time I started I started getting really angry, yet not I, but the beast in me. And you know, I told you before I would get in trance-like states. And I started, and, and I could tell when these things were coming on because my face would actually change. Like my jaw would move forward and I could just feel these things coming on. And my face started like changing. 
and like my jaw started moving forward and, and just different, different symptoms. And I could tell this, something bad's about to happen. And I'd seen some kids, a few rows up and I'm thinking, I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know what I'm going to do because of this thing on the inside of me, because I was certain at this point that I had a devil on the inside of me. I mean, he was working from the inside out and, and I'm not talking about some little anger problem or, or something I just, you know, an emotion I can't control. I'm talking about a literal beast on the inside of me, like something that would truly overtake my mind for moments at a time. Now, I still had a free will in things for the most part, but there's times I would just, I would just lose myself. And this thing would, would overtake me. So, uh, I forgot what I was going to, I forgot where I was going with that. Where was I going with that? Yes, the finger of God. This is my wife over here. She's helping me. She helps keep me on track. So yeah, the finger of God and this thing's being pressed out of me. And so I start getting violently mad and I almost got up and left the church. But I decided to stay put and I'm so glad that I did. Because see, let me back up a minute. When I was Right before I was going to the church, like I, I told y'all, I shared with that woman, hey, I'm going to church no matter what. See, what I didn't know is I had an appointment with God that night. And God got me to that church because I had an appointed time for this deliverance. And so I'm sitting there and this is the honest truth. I got up in the middle of this church and I took off running toward the preacher and it wasn't no altar call. I mean, I was running after him with violent intentions. And, but I guess some people had gathered up behind me and this is in a Pentecostal church and praise God for the Pentecostals. Um, my wife and I, we're non-denominational. We don't claim any certain denomination, but these things that happen in a Pentecostal church, they couldn't happen in some of these other churches. They would have Throw me, a, you know, called the police and had me thrown in a mental ward or a prison or something. But praise God, these Pentecostals knew how to deal with these things because they had ex had experience with these things. And so I take off running toward the preacher, and there's some, but there's some men that had gathered up behind me because I guess they saw some signs of some things going on, some anger and things. And so these guys grabbed me up, several guys, and one of them was about a 400 pound man. And all these guys grab me up and I'm just dragging all of these guys across the church. And the strength of man had nothing on this beast, this beast in me. So dragging all these guys, I mean, I, it, it's strength that I didn't have in myself. It was a supernatural strength, dragging all these guys across the church through row after row of chairs. But then the church circled around me and they started praying in this weird language I now know to be tongues. And, but see, I didn't know what it was at the time. I just heard these sounds of people praying in this different language. And so they're praying in tongues. And when they started praying in tongues over me, this supernatural strength just disappeared. I mean, where I was dragging all these guys through row after row of chairs all the way across the church, when they were praying in tongues over me, those prayers were overcoming the spirit, this demonic spirit on the inside of me. And to where I didn't even have, I didn't have any strength. I didn't even have enough strength to stand up after they started praying over me. And so I, they actually had to get a chair for me to sit down in. And the church just kept praying in tongues over me. And I just, just zapped all the strength of this demonic thing on inside of me. And I remember that it's like at some point I entered into the spiritual realm. And I remember this woman saying, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. And it's just like I entered into the spiritual realm. And it's like the wall of the church just disappeared. And I saw this great light coming out of the sky. And when this light, it was traveling, moving really fast. And when it got over me, it started raining on me. And it was a very pure white rain with a little bit of gold mixed in with it. And I'm now in the spiritual realm. And at this time, I remember that it's raining on me. The, the presence of God is on me. 
And I remember just at some point during this, I remember it's like my arms were just floating. It's like they were just floating up toward the sky. And I remember crying out and saying, Lord, I want to be free from this. I want to be free from this. And at this time, I literally, like let in the spirit, left my body. And I was drifting up toward the top of this church. And I remember thinking this thought. I remember thinking, I think the stress was too much on me. I think I just died. Like I really thought I had just died and I was actually drifting up into heaven. And I don't know how long I was up toward the top of this church, but when I finally come back to myself, so I come, I come back from, from the outside of my body, into my body, and my arms are stretched out, one foot in front of the other, like I'm hanging on the cross. And then I, I look at my hands, and it, I could physically, like naturally, now I'm, I'm back in myself now. I'm, like I said, I was in the spiritual realm, I come back in myself and I physically saw it looked like something had been driven through my hands. And that day I had like a literal encounter of being crucified with Christ as Galatians 2.20 talks about. It was a powerful, powerful, powerful experience. And it's one thing for me to tell the story, but for me to actually like have went through that and to experience that myself, it was awesome. It was so incredible. And, you know, what I just described to you was a four-hour encounter. I was, before church, I was kind of complaining about going to a two-hour Pentecostal service, and I was there four hours getting delivered. And so it was, it was quite a long time. Uh, but during the middle of this, somebody there actually knew my mom and called my mom up there. And my mom is a Christian um, but she's not, you know, she's not just like super spiritual or anything. And so when she got up there, she actually saw the last half of this. And I asked her one day, I said, mom, I said, what do you think about that day? And she said, well, she said, if I wouldn't have saw it, I wouldn't have believed it. She said, but I, I was there and, and she remembers seeing the print of the nails in my hands. And it was an awesome, awesome encounter with Jesus. And see, what happened that night is I got delivered. I got delivered from that demonic beast on the inside of me. And I just experienced a, a joy and a peace uh, that was just so awesome. And that night, I'm, I'm like, I'm not sinning anymore. I'm not doing drugs again. I'm not having sex outside of marriage again. And I'm not, I'm not doing all these, these things that went with the lifestyle and it was that night or the next day I started getting high again. But see, something had changed on the inside of me. Because now when I got high, I felt so convicted. And I would actually tell God, like, God, I, how can I keep doing what I'm doing with, after having this amazing encounter with you? And something had just radically changed in me. So I would actually get high on meth. And I would go outside, chain smoke my cigarettes, and just talk with God all day long. And I did that. There was a period of two weeks. I literally, um, me and that woman actually separated. I now see that as a, it was a divine thing. Uh, but we separated for two weeks, and I literally just got high on drugs and just prayed to God for two weeks. In a period of three days within those two weeks, I literally prayed all day long. I mean, I would pray all day and then go in at night, come out that next morning, pray all day. And then I did that for three days straight. And like I said, I would go in at night and, and, you know, do something different, but literally like during the day, I would just pray, just smoke cigarettes, do drugs and pray. <laughs> and on the third day I was doing that, that third day and God just called my heart out of the grave that day. And just like he called Lazarus out of the grave, he said, Lance, come forth. And he called my heart out of the grave and my heart just came alive. And all of a sudden, a he put a desire in my heart. And I remember a year prior that I had an opportunity to go to Bible college in Woodland Park, Colorado, Karis Bible College. And I'd actually rejected that offer. But in this moment, God just 
I mean, just put that desire in my heart. I mean, it's like, I had actually forgot about the whole the whole deal. I had rejected that offer and said I'm not going to Bible college. It was actually by uh, my one of my grandmas. She actually came up here to go to school or went to Karis to go to school. And she was 70 something years old, retired from school counseling, and went to school. And in this, like she had kept inviting me. I told her, you know, I called her Nana. I said, Nana, I said I am not going to Bible college. I just didn't have a desire to. And so, but in this moment when I'm praying, God just m makes my heart come alive and puts this desire in me to go to Bible college. And all of a sudden I realized because, see, I was praying for a way out. God, I want to change. I just don't know how. And in that moment, he put the desire in my heart to go to Bible college. And in an instant, I realized this is my way out. This is the way that God has provided me out. And if I don't take this, I'm going to die. I knew I would. I knew I was literally going to die if I didn't take this opportunity. And so I called her up right then, my Nana Kay. Her name was Kay Williams. And I called her up and said, Nana, uh, I said, you're not going to believe this, but I think I want to go to Bible college with you. So she said, great, I'm coming home in three weeks for Thanksgiving, and you can come back with me then. And so that three weeks that I had to wait till, for her to get there, because there's a winter term I was going to start in. I wasn't even thinking about it. If I would have really thought about it, I thought, well, school's already started. I can't go to school. But I didn't even think about it. And so there was three weeks, and it was just three weeks of hell. I mean, everything was crumbling around me, and it was just terrible. And I had to fight hard because there's so many things that was trying to talk me out of that decision. And even though I didn't tell a lot of people, there were so many things happening on the inside of me that just was trying to lead me out of that decision. But I just, I fought hard to hold on to that decision. Like I am going no matter what, I'm gonna hang on to this and I'm not letting go. Because I knew it was the Lord's will for my life and that I had to do it. And so anyway, um, Three weeks went by, and I didn't, that woman I was in a relationship with, I didn't tell her what I was doing until the day before I was leaving. And the reason I did that is because I knew, and I believe this was divine wisdom, I knew if I gave her enough time that she would be able to talk me out of it. And so I didn't tell her until a day before. And so I finally broke the news to her and said, hey, I said, tomorrow I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going to Colorado. And she did exactly what I thought she'd do. She tried to talk me out of it and play on my good heart, make me feel like I'm leaving her and stuff. But I didn't give the enemy enough time to talk me out of it. And so it was the day after Thanksgiving, which is when my dad's side of the family celebrates Thanksgiving. And I remember I did a shot of meth that morning and I went to Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving lunch. And I walked in and said, Nana, I said, did you get me a plane ticket? I said, I'm going to Colorado with you. <laughs> She said, no. She said, I really didn't think he was going. And it just, I had fought for three weeks just to hold on to this decision. And I felt like it just was for nothing. Because she didn't even get me a plane ticket. She didn't believe I was actually going to go. And it just, I was so deflated. I mean, I was so just discouraged. And anyway, she said, well, your bag's packed. And I said, no. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even plan on packing a bag. I was just going to go. But she said, well, go pack your bags, and I'll see if I can find you a ticket. And they got on there, and they found a ticket. And I ended up getting on. Like, how did. Can y'all hear me? I apologize. I'm having so many problems. Send me a comment. Let me know if you can hear me all right. Am I good? Everything good? I apologize. I'm having so many problems with this thing. 
Um, so yeah, I'm praying and told the Lord, uh, I was asking the Lord, I said, God, you know, how, that plane was full. How did we get a ticket last minute? And the Lord spoke to me and he told me, he said, that seat was reserved for you. And it was, I, I was sitting on the same row as my, my Nana Kay. It wasn't right next to her, but she was on the other wing. I could see her, but she wasn't sitting right next to me. And when I was talking with her about it later on, she said it was probably a good thing because if she would have known I was high, she probably wouldn't have let me go with her. But so I ended up getting on the plane and I uh, came to Karis, went to Karis Bible College, high on meth, and just got set free and was only there two and a half weeks, only clean two and a half weeks and went back to Arkansas for Christmas break. And the first night I just went to see a, an old friend and probably shouldn't have, but, um, no, I'm sorry. The first night I went with my brother somewhere and uh, went to some people's house that I actually used to sell drugs to. And they were, when I walked in, they were actually chopping up lines of cocaine. And I knew they were going to ask me if I wanted some. But see, I would just recently been filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I actually went out and started praying in tongues and and just praying that God would give me the strength to say no. And I went back in and they did exactly what I thought they'd do. They said, they said, Lance, you, you want some? And I said, nope. And I said it so quick and so strong that I actually surprised myself. I never said no to drugs up until that point. And I said, nope. And they said, they looked at me weird and said, are you sure? And I said, I'm sure. I said, I don't want any. And I actually had a great moment of victory in that moment. And it was, I think the next night or a couple nights later, I went to see an old friend and they knew I was trying to do better and stuff and they didn't offer me anything, but I just wanted a glass of water while I was over there. And I went to get a cup of water. And when I opened up the cabinet, there was a bunch of meth sitting right there in the cabinet where somebody had put it up. And it's just like, it's almost like it was just waiting on me. And so I was faced with it again. And so in that moment, I just, I actually picked it up. And I picked up the drugs and it was on a, it was on an aluminum foil, which is how they smoke it. And I picked it up and I looked at it and I said, I defeated you in the name of Jesus. And I threw it down and I had a moment of victory right then that I had overcome this, this false God who used to run my life, methamphetamine. And I just had a moment of victory over it. And I have been clean ever since. I've, I've never, never taken those drugs since then. Just been totally free. At the time, I was still smoking cigarettes, but about a month later, I ended up, uh, quit, I quit cigarettes, quit smoking, and... God has just totally cleaned me up. And, you know, even though I, I came to Bible college, I gave my life to the Lord, I was still being tormented by my thoughts because of all the junk that I had let in my mind. But now, I mean, God has totally renewed my mind through his word. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And because I've been in God's word and I've been in relationship with God, through prayer and through his word, I, I'm, a, I'm a total new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I've been totally made new. I, and now my thoughts, for the most part, are, are pure. And I don't, I don't have those wicked thoughts that I used to have. I don't have the perverted thoughts I used to have. I, I'm, now my mind is so much more clear because of God's word. And it is awesome. I'm just... I can't even relate to the old me. I mean, I think back to some things I, I've done, and I'm like, I can't believe I actually done that stuff. And God has just totally made me new. And so I, I went three years at Karis, and uh, just, it's an awesome, awesome place to be. And finished ministry school at Karis. And after Bible college, I started praying for a while. 
and I started praying, uh, you know, for a woman that, that loved Jesus, that would walk by faith, you know, a woman with a spirit of humility, full of grace and truth, and some things of that sort. And uh, even said, Lord, I, you know, I want a woman that's beautiful inside and out. Uh, and so I prayed for mostly inner biblical qualities and then even a few physical things. And I prayed for a year and a half. And one day, God supernaturally reconnected me with a woman that I had knew when I was in junior high school. And she was actually my junior high crush. I had a secret crush on this woman when I was like 13 or 14. Never told her that I liked her. And God supernaturally reconnected us. Uh, neither one of us were living in our home area. I was in Durant, Oklahoma, helping with a church there, Victory Life Church. And she was living in Little Rock, Arkansas, working with an association. And uh, we both went home for Christmas and we're in Walmart and she's waving at somebody. I thought she was waving at me, but she was actually waving at somebody behind me. <laughs> but that's, that's how it all, that's how God reconnected us. And six months later, we got married and she is just awesome. I mean, she loves the Lord. She is beautiful inside and out, just like what I prayed for. And uh, maybe one day on here, I'll, I'll introduce y'all to her. But she's just an incredible woman, and now she, God has done such a work in her life, delivered her out of bad relationships and things, and now she's actually in her first year at Karis Bible College, and I'm currently about to finish up my fourth year. Um, I finished ministry school before, and now I'm doing practical government school, and uh, we both want to be involved in ministry, and then I want to be involved in government as well and help restore biblical principles back in the American government. So that's my story. I've, you know, never really been anywhere except a prison cell before, and now I've been all over the world, France, England, Italy, Mexico, Honduras. Um, God's just taken me all over the world now. And life is so good now. I mean, my wife and I, we love each other. We love Jesus, and we just really enjoy life. And so that's my story. And, you know, I've left out a lot of detail just for time's sake, uh, but that's, that's the gist of it. And did I forget anything? No. Nope. So, yeah, and now just walking in victory and loving life, and hopefully we're going to start raising a family soon, and life is just so good. But I know what it's like to have nothing. I mean, I know what it's like to be at the bottom. And now I just, because of God, I'm, you know, at the top in a way. And he's just prospering me, provides for us financially. I've been healed of Crohn's disease. I've been healed of chronic fatigue, actually. And I'm much, much more healthier than I've ever been, both mentally and physically. I got such a love for the word. And, you know, I want to say that I didn't get that love for the word until I actually got filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a separate experience from salvation. And I don't, I don't know how a lot of you feel about that. Uh, I know some denominations teach it differently, but I'm telling you my experience. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and I just developed such a love for the Word, now I crave the Word like I do food. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. I just crave the Word. I want to get in the Word. I think on the Word when I'm doing other things. And... I want to encourage you to do that. When you're, when you're at work or, or doing other things, I want to encourage you to be thinking on the Word because it'll change the way you think and it'll change your habits and your lifestyle through changing the way you think. And so the Word of God is just powerful. And I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but in Mark chapter 4, it talks about the parable of the sower. And it talks about the seed. And in Peter, it says the seed is incorruptible. So it's an incorruptible seed, God's word. But in the parable of the sower, it talks about four different types of ground, which is talking about our heart. And out of the four types of ground, there's only one type of good ground. But when we receive the incorruptible seed, when we start planting God's word in our heart, in our mind, it brings forth change. It's just how it works. And there's a God's principle of seed, time, and harvest. And when we start planting his word 
in our heart and in our mind and we hold on to it and we don't we don't let anything take that seed take his word from us and we continue to be in his word and continue a, a relationship with him it starts changing us from the inside out and that is how i've come out of that mess just through a prayer life with jesus and and meditating on his word and speaking his word over our life it's been awesome so that's that's my story i really appreciate y'all listening uh, i'm gonna be back with y'all every sunday night and yeah i look forward to interacting with y'all so let me pray for you real quick father we just thank you that you're a good god we thank you that you love us uh father i just thank you for everyone watching and everyone who will watch and father i just Thank you for the seeds of the kingdom being planted in their heart. Father, may they hear of your goodness through the story I just shared. And Father, every one of us, thank you for helping us to walk in victory. In Jesus' name, to be free financially, to be free spiritually, to be free in our bodies, to be free from sickness and disease. Father, I just declare it victory, total victory over everyone watching and everyone who will hear this message in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, well, God bless y'all, and thank y'all so much for listening and, and commenting. God bless.